And turn with me this morning to Acts chapter 4. Acts, the fourth chapter. You know, we're privileged this year to kick off our prayer and fasting emphasis on the very first day of the New Year's. That doesn't happen that often. And so here we are on the very first New Year's Day in the house of the Lord getting to kick off our prayer and fasting emphasis. You know, as I mentioned earlier, our prayer and fasting theme this year is awakening. Awakening. And I told you I'd give you a few more details of that, so I'm going to do that here in the message. There are specific prayer focuses for every single day of the week. Let me just run down through those. You've got them in your bulletin, but let's look at those together. Monday, tomorrow, the prayer focus is compassion. Don't you think the world needs a little more, how about a lot more compassion, amen? So compassion. Then Tuesday, Tuesday is signs and wonders. And every Tuesday morning, we start out with our hour of power prayer time. That'll be a special prayer time at 9 o'clock on Tuesday morning. That is every single Tuesday morning. And then in the afternoon, as we said before, every afternoon, 5.30 is going to be our devotion, our our. Um, uh, our live and in-house and online devotion. It'll be focused on signs and wonders as well. Then Wednesday will be our testimony service, and the prayer focus is going to be united prayer. United prayer. Then Thursday, global connection. How many of you all know the Bible or the body of Christ is connected around the world through the Holy Spirit? Amen. Friday is going to be intercession and evangelism. And get this, Saturday's prayer focus, passing revival to the next generation. How many of you all know we must pass on our Pentecostal heritage to the next generation or else it will end with us? It doesn't just automatically happen. We've got to do it. Can somebody say amen? Amen. So each day, along with our prayer emphasis, we'll be focusing on drawing closer to God and awakening the prayer warrior inside of us. How many of you all know every single one of us have a prayer warrior inside of us? Not a a meek, timid prayer person, but a powerful prayer warrior for God. So every day this week, we're going to be focusing on that emphasis and prayer for each day and then also drawing closer to the Lord to awaken that prayer warrior in us. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the key for an awakening to the presence of God and that presence of God in our lives each and every day. And so we're focused on that. We're believing for that closer walk. We're believing for that deeper presence of God through the Holy Spirit. And we don't simply want an experience with God this week. We don't simply want to encounter God this week. We don't simply want to feel the presence of God this week. Are you with me? We want to do something different. We want to have an awakening in us that draws us closer to God, that leads us, an awakening that leads us into his purposes for us for 2023. Can I get a witness this morning? Amen. 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 And you know what's the key to this? A Uh, The key to it is a consistent prayer life. A consistent prayer life is key to awakening the prayer warrior in you. That's where the key is. That's, That's where this all really comes down to. That's what really makes the difference. That's what really kicks our prayer life up to the next level in the presence of God, amen, and under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. A consistent prayer life, a prayer life where we are being very, very intentional, where we're, we're setting aside the time, not, not just when I have time, but we're making the time, amen, that we're determined that we're going to have that prayer life that awakens that prayer warrior inside of each of us. You know, Jesus' disciples went from not knowing how to pray Come on. Jesus' disciples went from not knowing how to pray to being prayer warriors that their prayers literally shook their world. You know, one day the disciples were watching Jesus pray. Jesus had a consistent prayer life. And the disciples were watching Jesus while he was praying. And they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. 
Now, I have a question for you this morning. Why hadn't Jesus already taught his disciples how to pray? Come on, he had already been with them for a while, right? Doesn't that matter? Have you ever, have you ever read that passage and got to that place and say, well, why didn't, why didn't Jesus already teach his disciples how to pray? But, but here they are asking that question. Well, let me tell you why. Because they weren't ready to learn how to pray. Jesus hadn't taught his disciples how to pray yet because they weren't ready to learn how to pray. See, a a prayer life can't be forced upon you. You have to desire for it yourself. And the disciples had witnessed the benefits that Jesus had received through his prayer life, and they wanted those same benefits for themselves. They had witnessed day after day, Jesus was with them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they'd witnessed, Jesus would slip off. Well, where are you going, Jesus? Well, I'm going, I'm going to pray. I'm going to talk to my heavenly Father. Well, well, Lord, it's supper time. Well, I have food to eat that you know not of because I'm going to talk to my heavenly Father. I'm going to spend time in his presence. And after a while, they began seeing all the benefits of Jesus' consistent prayer life, and they said, we need that. How many of you all have come to realize that you need a consistent prayer life, that you need the benefits of spending time in the presence of the Lord? Can I get an amen this morning? And so they begin to witness that, and so they went to the Lord, and they said, Lord, teach us, teach us how to pray. Here in Acts chapter 4, the disciples have been taken before the Sanhedrin, and they're commanded to stop preaching about Jesus. Jesus is gone, put in the grave, resurrected on the third day, ascended into heaven. They're on their own now. And so they get called before the Sanhedrin. They get called before the highest authority in the Jewish culture, the Sanhedrin, the council. They get called before that council, and now they have to answer for themselves. Let's take a look and see what their prayer life had to do with that call. Let's let's take and see what happened next and how their prayer life had transformed to this point. Follow along with me. Acts chapter 4 beginning at verse 23. Acts chapter 4, verse 23. And being let go, the disciples being let go from the Sanhedrin, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God and with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David had said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord... Look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, say prayed with me this morning, prayed. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was physically shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. You see, the disciples were powerful prayer warriors because of their consistency in prayer. Did you hear what Pastor just said? The disciples were powerful prayer warriors. Why? Because of their consistency in prayer. See, the more consistent our prayer life, the deeper our prayer walk. Did you hear me this morning? The more consistent our prayer life, the deeper our prayer walk. Now, listen, there's a couple of things that's happening right now. 
in the spirit realm, in our hearts and minds, there's a couple of things that are happening right now. There are some individuals that you're getting excited in your spirit because you have a consistent prayer life, but you're realizing right now by the word and by the spirit that you can go farther, you can go deeper, there's a next level for you to get to, and your spirit is getting excited right now. There are other individuals today that the enemy is calling into question your prayer life and so that you are allowing him right now to bring condemnation on you because of where your prayer life is. And I've got to tell you that your heavenly father is not a part of that today. Jesus is not a part of that today. He's not here to judge you. He's here to help you walk in a deeper walk with him. He's here to help you through the Holy Spirit to gain a more consistent and more powerful powerful prayer walk. He's here to awaken the prayer warrior in you. Can somebody say amen? amen. Now there's a third individual today and the Holy Spirit's speaking to my heart and speaking to their heart. And right now you don't understand this prayer thing. You don't see the importance of the prayer thing. I don't know if you're in the house or if you're at home watching right now. You feel it's okay just to talk to the Lord every now and then, especially over your dinner time and thank Him. You know, God is good. God is great. And you feel a little bit challenged right now. Well, good. Good. I'm glad you feel challenged right now. You notice I didn't say I didn't say condemned. I said challenged. Amen. Because it's time for us to move forward in a prayer that brings the power and the presence of God from heaven down to earth. Amen. The manifest presence of God that makes a difference in our lives and the lives of someone else. See, the more consistent your prayer life, the deeper your prayer walk. And the deeper your prayer walk with God, the more, f more on fire you are for God. The more on fire you are for God. You know, I noticed that my neighbors didn't have any problem whatsoever spending all last evening setting off fireworks. They loved the boom. They loved the splash of color. And then it got about midnight, you know, and all of a sudden their enthusiasm for fireworks reached its crescendo. I've not been in the military. I've never been in active duty, so I don't want to give the perception that I have. But in my mind, I could have been in the middle of the battlefield. There was booms and explosions going on everywhere, and I could hear some cheers from dis dis distant neighbors. Yay, yay, yay. You know what? I can tell you that there are people that their enthusiasm for fireworks never fades. It doesn't matter what occasion it is, what opportunity it is, if they can light the wick and watch it go boom, they're going to get excited. Do you understand what pastor's saying? Well, I'm telling you this morning, this is one old boy that his excitement for the fire of God never dims down one little bit. Can somebody say amen? I'm more excited about the presence of God and being in the presence of God and drawing closer to him today than the day I gave my heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be more on fire for Jesus in 2023 than I've ever been before in my life. How about you? Amen. You see, a consistent prayer life ignites the fire of the prayer warrior that's already locked up inside of you. That consistent prayer life ignites the fire of a prayer warrior that cannot be denied, that will not be denied, that's already locked up inside of you. And consistent prayer is the most important thing that we can do. Now, I realize that's a bold statement, but it's the truth. It's not just one of the most important things that we can do. Consistent prayer is the most important thing that we can do. Everything else comes from prayer. Everything else comes from prayer. Listen, nothing happens in the kingdom of God but somebody prayed about it first. Now, I don't have time to go into a deep theological explanation on that. You can talk to me about it later if you want. You can study in the Word and find out those truths for yourself, however you want to do it. But I'm going to tell you that is the absolute truth. Prayer is the most thing we, important thing we can do. And consistent prayer is even more important than just prayer. See, God can and does give us immediate answers to prayer. Amen? 
God can and does give us immediate answers to prayer. Let me take a little bit of a poll this morning. How many of you all have experienced God giving you an immediate answer to one of your prayers? Praise God. Look around now. I want everybody to get encouraged. Look around. Hands are up. That's testimonies. God does it. Amen. God does it. There have been times that I have prayed, and before I got done praying, God had already sent the answer. There are times that I prayed, and by the time I laid my head down that night and got up the next morning, got into the office or wherever I needed to go, I discovered God had taken care of the situation. Amen? God can and does give us immediate answers to our prayers. But listen, most of our answers come through consistent prayer. Am I telling the truth this morning? Have you had more prayers answered through consistent prayer, faithful prayer, long-time prayer than immediate prayers? Those immediate prayers are wonderful. But how many of y'all had to keep praying for a while before the answer came? How many of y'all had to keep trusting a while before the answer came? Amen, amen. Most of our prayers come that way. Most of our prayers come through consistent, our answers to prayer come through consistent prayer. Jesus used a parable to teach his disciples about consistent prayer. Luke chapter 18, Luke chapter 18 verse 1. It says, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Projection team, I'm going to pause here for a moment. See, so many people believe that Jesus taught the disciples about prayer one time. That he gave them the Lord's Prayer, lesson done. No, throughout his entire ministry, he was teaching his disciples and through them, you and I, all about prayer, all about talking to the Heavenly Father, all about how to have a successful communication with God that changes our lives, transforms our lives, and impacts the lives of others. Can somebody say amen? So here we are. Let me start again. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not pray give up. Can somebody say amen? Amen. He, Jesus said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. Yep, that's believable. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. That's believable too. So uh, for some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, self, Even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet, because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. Now the moral of the story. Verse 6. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him when? Day and night. Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. Hallelujah. Isn't that exciting passage of scripture this morning? Jesus teaching us about consistent prayer, the power of consistent prayer. You see, when you are persistent, even an unjust judge will do the right thing. When you're persistent, even somebody that doesn't care about God or care about man or care about you, if you're persistent, even they'll be forced at times to do the right thing. How much more? How much more can we trust our Heavenly Father to hear and answer our prayers because He loves us? Mary, the enemy, don't want us to believe that. Joyce, he wants us to think that a prayer delayed is a prayer denied. But that's simply not the truth. Every time you pray as a son or daughter of God, your prayers are important and precious before the throne of God. I can't explain it. I don't understand it. But I know that I know that I know in my heart that even, oh, another billion Christians are praying to the Heavenly Father the same time I am. My prayer gets personal attention from God himself because he's a good, good father. Can somebody say amen? amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. So why does it seem like God is delaying his answers at times? 
He's a good, good father. He loves us. We can trust him to answer our prayers. But why? Why is it that sometimes it seems like God is delaying the answers to our prayers? Listen, every answer to prayer is a part of God's plan. Every answer to prayer is a part of God's plan at work in our life and the lives of others. We need to understand that. See, I have too much of a simplistic view. Lord, this happened. I need you to take care of it, and I need you to take care of it now. Kind of simple, right? Lord, I talked to you about this yesterday. And I was fervent in my prayer, Lord, because the, the word says that of the fervent prayer of a righteous man. Now, Lord, remember, I'm, I'm righteous through Jesus Christ. The fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Lord, I, I spoke to you about this yesterday, and I, I still don't have it. By the end of the week, Lord, I've been talking to you all this week about it. Remember that five minutes that I pray every morning? In that five minutes, I mentioned this. I've been faithful to mention this every morning so you don't forget. Lord, why? Right? And the Heavenly Father has this wonderful divine plan that he knew before time began. Can you comprehend that? No, let's try for a moment this morning. That our Heavenly Father knew before time began, Walter, that you were going to have that need. He already incorporated into his plan, Walter's going to have this need. And he's going to talk to me about it. And this is what I'm going to do through that need. I'm going to do this work and this work and this work in Walter, and then through him, as I take him through that process, as I do this work in him, I'm going to do this work through him into the lives of others. And this is how it's going to fit into my grand plan coming into the end of the age. Aren't you glad that you don't have to keep track of all that for 7.6 billion people? Every prayer, every need, every request that's taken before the throne of God, God has a plan for already. I'm so blessed to know that whenever I get into the most difficult situations of my life, there's not an emergency meeting taking place in heaven where Jesus goes to the Heavenly Father and says, you see what that John Hensel did now? What are we going to do about that? Do we got enough angels to take care of that situation? God never says, well, I didn't see that coming. He knows. Why is it so important for us to understand that? Because when we understand that our prayer request and our need is a part of God's plan, then we realize that he's doing a greater work in us than just answering the need, even though the need might be really important to us. He's doing something else in the process. And listen, consistent prayer then allows God to work out his plan and provide the answer. Now, I'm going to give you something else. Are you ready? You might want to write this one down. You might be the answer to the prayer somebody else has been praying. You might be the answer to the prayer somebody else is praying. I I think sometimes we get this in our mind that every time we pray in heaven, God just goes, Zap. Zap. How many of y'all know he can do that? God can speak to anything that is not as it is, and it comes into existence. But we find throughout the scriptures, he works through his children. Hey, we're a child of God. We're part of the family of God. We're responsible 
for holding up the family name. Can somebody say amen? We're responsible for the family business. And the family business is about blessing people and ministering the truth of the gospel in their lives. And you know there's probably somebody that God is talking to about your need. I remember back a couple of months ago, we were needing some extra funds here at the church. We needed some more tithes to come in. And I'm all the time praying. I was praying about that. And the Lord spoke to somebody's heart. And they came in and they paid their tithe. And they hadn't paid for such a long time that it was a large amount of money. Now, I can look at it two different ways. One, I could look at it and say, well, if they had been listening to God all along, we wouldn't have been a problem because they'd have kept paying their tithes, right? But I can look at it this way. They finally listened to God, answered the prayer that we had need of. Can somebody say amen? amen. So there's probably somebody, you've got a need, and you've been praying about it, and there's somebody that God is speaking to about doing what they need to do to help answer your prayer. Don't you want them to hurry up? Come on, how many of y'all want them to hurry up and listen to God? Come on, be honest. How many of y'all, will you want them to hurry up and listen to, to, right? Well, you're the answer to somebody else's prayer. And that person is praying, Lord, help them hurry up, right? Help them hurry up and listen to you so that my prayer need gets answered. Consistent prayer allows God to work out his plan and provide the answer to our prayer needs. See, consistent prayer draws us closer to God, allowing him to work in us and through us and accomplishing his purpose for us and for others in the process. And consistent prayer changes the world. Consistent prayer changes the world. It does. You see, a consistent prayer life took the disciples from hiding in the upper room after Jesus' crucifixion to boldly proclaiming the word of God. Have you ever thought about that? Here's a ragtag bunch of guys that Jesus had pulled together, and he explained to them. He told them in advance that he was going to be crucified. He explained to them. He told them that he was going to rise on the third day. He explained all this to them, and after the crucifixion, where were they at? They were held up in the upper room with the door locked because they were afraid of who? The Jewish leaders. Come on now, follow me on this. They were so afraid of the Jewish leaders that they locked themselves in an upper room. But we just read that they were pulled before the Sanhedrin. And they spoke boldly to the Sanhedrin and they said to them, whether we should obey you or God, you decide. But we can't do anything except for proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Something powerful had happened in their lives, and they were changing not only their world, but they were changing the world around them. Let's take a look at how consistent prayer transformed the disciples into prayer warriors. First of all, the disciples learned through consistent prayer the power of corporate prayer. Look back at verse 24. Acts chapter 4, verse 24. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with what? One accord. Say that with me. With one accord. And said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the seas and all that is in them. You know, the disciples didn't just show up for a prayer meeting one time and the power of God fell. They didn't just, they didn't show up one time and in that, that one time prayer meeting, all of a sudden the power of God fell. They had been consistently coming together in prayer over and over and over again. You notice that when they walked into that room, all of the believers were already gathered. Why were the believers already gathered? Because they were walking into a prayer meeting. 
Those believers had been consistently gathering together in prayer. When the disciples got released from the Sanhedrin, what did they say? They said, we're going to go to the prayer meeting. They don't know what's happening to us. They don't know what's going on, but we're going to go and we're going to tell them what's going on. So they walk into the prayer meeting and they walk into the prayer meeting. What happens after they give their report? Everybody sits around moaning and groaning about how bad the Sanhedrin is. No. What do they immediately do? They immediately begin crying out to God. They immediately begin doing what they've been doing consistently all along. Lord, you hear their threats. You hear what they're saying. See, when they come together in agreement, God is present to answer their prayers. When we come together in agreement, God is present to answer our prayers. Matthew chapter 18, verses 19 and 20. Again, again, I say to you, Jesus talking, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Folks, there is power in corporate prayer. There is power in in corporate prayer. Yes, we can pray by ourselves. Yes, our Heavenly Father answers, but there is a manifest presence of God. The Scripture says that Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. There is a manifest reality of God's presence. Can somebody say amen? The disciples learn through consistent prayer that God can be trusted to work out his plan. Acts chapter 4, look at verse 27. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together, listen, to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Do you notice what they said? Jesus was beaten and crucified. Because it was the Heavenly Father's will and purpose for that to be done. Wow. He's the Son of God. But it was still the Heavenly Father's will. You know, Jesus said to Pontius Pilate, you could do nothing to me if I didn't allow you to do so. Literally, Jesus could have spoke the word. He could have said, Father, I'm done with this. Come get me out of here. And the heavenly Father would have sent tens of thousands of angels to take Jesus down off the cross and wipe, wipe every smirk and, smear, or smirk and smile off the faces of every individual that had spoken anything against the Lord. But the Scripture says that Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but He came that, the, but that through Him the world might be saved. The disciples realized in that moment they were being persecuted by the Sanhedrin. And even though they didn't fully understand everything that was happening, everything that was going on, they had learned through consistent prayer that they could trust God in the most difficult and darkest times of their life, that this is a part of your plan too, Lord. I don't understand it. Come on. How many of you all have gone through things that you don't understand, you didn't understand? I remember back whenever I was in college, Sister Fran and I, we had left good jobs. We went to Southeastern uh, to get my ministerial degree. We were barely making it on the money that I was able to bring in. And I got severely sick, deathly sick. 
As a matter of fact, I was trying to finish up an exam, and it got to the place where I was sitting there, and I could no longer read the paper. And so I went out to my car, just barely made it home. I won't give you the whole story. I was running a temperature well over 103 degrees. They found out that I had two things. I had spinal meningitis, and then I had another virus that was so new, so foreign to them, they called it virus X. And I was so weak and so sick that the organs of my body were shutting down. I didn't fully know and understand while I was in that situation. But my mom told me afterwards, she said, son, you were dying. And there's some wonderful things that God did through that, some things that I, I, I can witness to you and tell you about and how I was able to witness to the man in the bed beside me before he died and he gave his heart and life to Jesus. If I hadn't have been there, he would have went into an eternity in hell, but now he's in heaven because I was his roommate and I led him to the Lord. There was a nurse that at, at night, her, she was so dysfunctional, her life was so messed up, she'd forget to give me my medications, but she'd come in and tell me all of her problems and I was so sorry sick and hurting so bad and I would pray for her night after night. There's a lot of things that God did. But I want to tell you this morning, I still don't fully understand why God allowed that to happen in my life. But I'll tell you what, I trust him for it. Amen. Amen. I trust him for it. He had a plan. He had a purpose. And he was working out that plan and that purpose. And that's what God consistently does. The disciples knew that they could trust God in this situation because it was a part of his plan. He didn't say, oh, no, what are we going to do now? He's saying, I'm going to work this out for my glory and for your good. Amen. And that's what he's saying in your life when you trust him through a consistent prayer life. I'm going to work this out, too, for, my, for your good and my glory. The disciples also learned through consistent prayer that God can be trusted in his plan. But having a consistent prayer life allows us to stay connected to God while he's working out the plan. When we have a consistent prayer life, listen, everything in our human nature says we're going to cut and run. Come on, let's be honest. But when we have that consistent prayer life, it enables us to stay connected to God while he's working out that plan. And God uses the consistent prayer life of the disciples to change the world. Let's look back at verse 31 again. Acts chapter 4 verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. I'm going to break that down quickly for you. Look at this. The church in Jerusalem was changed by the manifest presence of God. Here was a group, a body of believers that had been coming together and praying and praying and believing and they'd seen God answer prayer and they'd seen God answer prayer and they'd seen God answer prayer. But on this night, God showed up in such a physical way, such a personal way, such a manifest presence of God that the house that they were meeting in literally shook from God's presence. You think what that did to the prayer meeting attendance from then on. That transformed that group of believers. They'd experienced the reality of God up close and personal. And then the individual believers were changed as they were awakened by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. What does it say? It says, and they were all, say that with me, all. And they were all filled. Come on, say that with me, all. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Listen, we've got to get to the place where we are no longer happy with the status quo. Can somebody say, Amen. Amen. Now I'm going to get into big trouble, so you pray for me. Because what I'm about to say, I'm going to get into big trouble, but you just pray for me. There are those in this body of believers online and in this house that you grew up understanding about the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Can I get a witness? Ever since you were young, you experienced the presence of God. You experienced the Holy Spirit moving. People you knew had been filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they were being used in the gifts of the Spirit, in, in, in prophecy and in tongues and interpretation of tongues. There are others of you in the church that you didn't grow up in that experience. Your background is not that. There's some of you that you didn't even come to know the Lord Jesus Christ until you were much farther along in life 
life. Does anybody know what pastor's talking about? That's right. How many of you know God loves you so very much and he was so excited whenever you finally listened to his voice and now you're a part of the body of Christ and the family of God. There are others of you that grew up and you, you were in church, but you were in other Christian backgrounds. Some of you all were Episcopal and some of you all were Lutheran and some of you all were Methodist and some of you all were Catholic. And, and the moving of the Spirit was not something that you grew up being familiar with, but you understood the presence of the Lord because you have been praying and you know what it's like to have the Holy Spirit living inside of you and you know what it's like to experience God's wisdom and grace flowing in your life. But listen, now is not the time for us to stop in our experience with God and the Holy Spirit. Now's the time to march on through the door and receive everything that God has for us in 2023. Can somebody say amen? I want to encourage you this morning. If you're saved, you've received the Holy Spirit into your life because Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to indwell, live inside of every single believer that's accepted Him as Lord and Master and Savior. But there's another gift and there's another blessing and it's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And whenever you cry out and say, Lord, I want everything that you have for me and you seek it with your whole heart, there comes a time when the Holy Spirit comes and baptizes you in Him self and empowers you to be used by him with the gifts of the spirit. I want to tell you it's life transformational. You see from a very young age I had the Holy Spirit living inside of me. I'd given my heart and life to Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact I'm going to honestly tell you I've done some really stupid things in my life. And Sister Fran can testify to some of them. And if it wasn't for the fact that I had already given my heart and life to the Lord, that the Holy Spirit was with me, I probably wouldn't be here standing in front of you today. But there came a point in time in my life after I had backslidden and walked away from the Lord that I came back to Jesus and it was life transforming. When I rededicated my life to the Lord, it was like a a switch was turned on and I was on fire for God and I wanted everything that God had for me. And in a little Pentecostal church down in Fort Myers, Florida, in a night service, I walked forward not knowing what I wanted, but all of a sudden the Holy Spirit said, I know what you need. And he filled me and empowered me with the Holy Spirit and I spoke in tongues for two hours hours solid and every time I'd get up and try to leave the service I'd turn around and fall down on my knees and begin crying out to God because he had done such a wonderful work in my life and empowered me and I was afraid if I left the church building this that I'd received would not leave with me and I didn't want to go but you know what I've discovered he's been with me Every moment of every day, of every week, of every hour, of every month, of every year ever since then. And if I draw close to him, that he works in me mightily and powerfully. And listen, it's not just for Pastor Hensel. It's for absolutely sing, every single believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Can somebody say amen today? That's what we need. That's what we want. And I want to tell you, as those believers on this day were filled with the Holy Spirit of God, they were empowered for greater things and the, and, and, and the The world was changed by the boldness and faithfulness of the believers, the Scripture says, and they spoke the Word of God with boldness. Folks, we need to be bold for Jesus. You know, all the disciples were hiding in an upper room. And then the Scripture says, on the day of Pentecost, they were all together in one place, and what were they doing? They were praying. They were in one accord, and the power of the Holy Spirit fell on them and empowered them. And the same disciple Peter who had just been hiding is now standing before a crowd of people preaching one of the most eloquent message he'll ever preach in his life, and 3,000 people accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. What was the difference? The empowering of the Holy Spirit. I want to invite our musicians to come back to the platform now. You know, we need to be shaken this week. Can somebody say amen? Amen. We need to be shaken this week. We we, We need the prayer warrior inside of us to be awakened within us. Amen? The prayer warrior inside of us to be awakened within us. 
You need to be shaken this week. You know, the things that we've set up this week are purposely set up to disrupt your schedule. I'm going to be honest with you. A 5.30 prayer devotional time every night this week. How many of y'all got something else you're usually doing at 5.30 every afternoon? Yeah. Yeah. Asking you to make commitments to special times of prayer this week and to fasting. Asking you not only to be here today, but asking you to come back next Sunday morning for a holy convocation. And then, and then asking you to come back Sunday night. Everything we're doing is meant to disrupt our schedule. So that things aren't business as usual. So that we'll spend this week. How many of y'all realize this week is going to be gone like that? But listen. The transformational results of what God can do through his spirit in our lives in this one week. Will continue to be felt through all of 2023 and even beyond that. Because it's all part of God's plan. Amen. God is so good. This will happen as we develop and strengthen our consistent prayer life this week. If you already have a consistent prayer life, get ready for God to take it to the next level. Can somebody say amen? If you've been struggling with how to pray, get ready, get ready, because God's going to help you pray in a deeper and stronger and better and richer way than you ever have before. Then we'll come into the Father's house with an expectation of His manifest presence. I had a minister friend of mine say, uh, I think it was about six months ago, he said to me, you know what, Pastor? I said, what? He said, I'm getting so sick and tired of hearing it said, oh, that was a good service. Now, you think about that for a moment. He said, I'm getting so sick and tired of hearing, oh, that's a good service. He said, I don't want good services. I want transformational services. I want powerful services in the presence of God. I want services where when people walk in, they experience the Lord Jesus Christ in a way that they never have experienced before. We've had individuals come into this service, and one person told me after they were in one of our services that the presence of the Lord was so powerful and so strong that they could hardly breathe. Do you hear that this morning? That's the manifest presence of God. Can somebody say amen? this morning. Give him praise today. Go ahead. Give him praise today. He's worthy of it. Hallelujah. Not only will we come into the Father's house with an expectation of his manifest presence, but then we'll also seek to remain filled with the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. You know, we leak. Did you know that we leak? So we need to be refilled, amen? That's what, that's what Peter said. So be refilled, be refilled with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Then we'll see the world change through our boldness and our faithfulness. You're the change that God wants to see in the world, amen? You're the change that God wants to see in the world. You're the hope. You're the hope of this community. You're the hope of this nation in 2023. Can somebody say amen this morning? Praise God, praise God, praise God. 